Hello, I'm David Kenyon and I'm the research historian here at Bletchley Park. Today I'm going to talk to you about Bletchley Park's role in the Battle of Britain and that story starts here in the drawing room of the mansion. Here we are in the drawing room. This room currently contains an exhibition about Bill Tutt, who was one of Bletchley's less well-known but really, really important code breakers. However, in 1939, when the war started, this room was actually the home of Air Section under Josh Cooper. When GCNCS first moved to Bletchley Park, the whole organisation was uh, accommodated here in the mansion, and there are three main rooms here. This is the drawing room, which had Air Section in it. Next door is the dining room, which had Military Section in it, and across the corridor is the library that had naval section. This room would have looked very different in 1939. It would have been crammed with desks and typewriters and telephones and about 20 people worked in here at that time. Air section came with uh, nine men and nine women plus Josh Cooper, their boss. Uh, if you visit Bletchley Park now you can get a sense of what these rooms would have been like in 1939 because the library across the way has been set dressed to look like it would have at the time. We don't have any photographs of this room from 1939, but we do have photographs of the library, which gives us a real sense of what the place would have been like in those early days. In the late summer of 1940, after the fall of France, of course, Britain becomes involved in the Battle of Britain, uh, the German air campaign against the UK. And of course, air section at Bletchley is at the heart of that operation because they're listening to German Air Force communications, and trying to make as much sense of them as they can and use that to, to help fight the battle. Some of this work happened at Bletchley Park, but a lot of it happened in the north of England at Cheadle, where the RAF had one of their so-called Y stations. This was a listening station that listened to German radio traffic. And the German radio traffic fell into various sorts of categories. There were obviously pilots in the air talking to one another with voice communications, what's called uh, radio telephony or RT, then you had aircraft communicating with the ground using wireless morse, known as WT, and then you had the more strategic communications between the administration of the Air Force and the different bases and things like that. And all of these different groups used different code systems. The one that Bletchley was most concerned with was the air-to-ground wireless WT communication. And this was morse code using a relatively simple cipher system, uh, or three-letter code, it was in fact not a cipher, um, where groups of three letters would have specific meanings. Members of Air Section became very expert in breaking this particular system, and in the end it was decided that doing this work at Bletchley was too remote, and a number of people were sent from Bletchley actually to the Y station at Cheadle, so they could be right there where the messages were being received, and break them on the spot. And this meant that the the turnaround time for the information was really, really short and they could communicate with the Air Ministry or Fighter Command or whoever it was and literally participate in the battle as it was going on. Up in Cheadle doing this work, intercepting these wireless messages. There was also a team uh, looking at the voice traffic, so pilots talking to one another, and you think they're just talking to one another in German, but, which they are, but in addition to that they're using a lot of code words and secret phrases um, so their language wouldn't be plain German, it would be full of all sorts of obscurities. Some of you may be wondering why I haven't mentioned Enigma yet, which is of course the most famous code bro broken here at Bletchley. Uh, Enigma of course played a part in the Battle of Britain because the German Air Force were using it for communication between their bases on the ground, their different airfields, and one of the first Enigma systems broken by Bletchley was the, the so-called RED uh, network, which was run by the Luftwaffe. So they were also getting a very large amount of information from Enigma about the German Air Force. Uh, unlike the stuff which was coming from the three-letter codes and the voice traffic, which was really kind of immediate and tactical and dealt with what was happening that day, the Enigma material was much more long-term. It was more giving a strategic picture and allowing them to build up the, the, the wider organisation of the German Air Force and how it was administering itself and how many aeroplanes it had left how many planes were coming from factories and things like that. So equally important, but a kind of a different strand of the work. And such was the security around Enigma at that point that most of the people in air section who were doing three-letter codes were completely unaware of the Enigma work and it was kept separate. It was only later on when they realised that 
information from the Enigma messages could help to understand the other traffic, that a few people were allowed to know about both, so they could do a process which is called fusion, which is kind of comparing the two and work, getting the best benefit from both. So Enigma is in there, but that's mostly being done by HUT3 and HUT6. It's broken in HUT6, uh, while Air Section, Josh Cooper's people, are working on the what's called minor codes, the three-letter ciphers and the voice traffic. The Battle of Britain in the late summer of 1940 is a crucial time for Britain. The country's really fighting for its life at that point, and the RAF is stretched to the limit. Uh, they're having to use all sorts of uh, clever ideas to maximise their resources, and we're familiar with the Observer Corps spotting aircraft coming in with radar, and with the famous plotting rooms like at Uxbridge, where the, the fighters were coordinated to attack the Germans. Of course, a fundamental part of that as well that you don't hear about is all of this additional intelligence that's coming from signal intelligence from Bletchley and from Cheadle. And it's an absolutely vital contribution to that process. Uh, as I said, the resources are so stretched that sometimes uh, the intelligence can't be acted upon and things are learnt about the Germans that the RAF just can't do anything about because they don't have enough aircraft. But uh, every little helps and as we know, by the end of September, the Germans had basically failed in their attempt to destroy the RAF and gain air superiority over Britain. So we look back now on the Battle of Britain as a vital success story in the Second World War and Bletchley Park had a vital role to play in that.